you cannot hear me. Hello, <laughs> welcome. My name is Chinyeti Tutashinda, and I am the new executive director for the Center for Third World Organizing and a founding member and founding co-director of the Blackout Collective. And I wanna welcome you to our track um, our first session today will be all about organizing resources and money, and I'm here to introduce you to our development team, um, who will take it from there. So I will pass it to you, Kiera, um, Michelle, and Ren, who will introduce you to who they are, as well as like dive into content. Thanks for joining. Hi everyone, welcome to our session. This is Michelle. I am the development manager here at Seed2. And we would love it if folks uh, could check in in the chat uh, with your pronouns, your organization and your role, and also what your favorite movement chant or song is. And my pronouns are she, her, and ella in Spanish. Um, uh, one of my favorite movement songs is one that's in Spanish. Um, and it talks about people power and the people claiming what's rightfully theirs. And uh, it's one of my favorite um, songs to sing whenever we're out um, doing an action in the community. Kiara Ren, would y'all like to share? Yes, thank, Mich thank you, Michelle. Um, my name is Kiera. I use she, her pronouns. And right now, the one that comes to mind is um, We Who Believe in Freedom Cannot Rest. It's one of my favorite songs. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for introducing yourselves. Uh, this is Ren. Happy to be here. Um, I use they, them pronouns. And a favorite is just the classic No Justice, No Peace. Um, yeah. Always a good one. And I'm gonna pass it to Kira to kick us off. Yeah, so thank you for joining us this afternoon. We just wanna give you a, a bit of information about the Center for Third World Organizing before we get started. Um, the Center for Third World Organizing is a racial justice organization dedicated to building social justice movements led by people of color. Um, we were established over 40 years ago in 1980 as a training um, and resource center for folks to come um, and get educated and skilled up. Um, we believe in creating a pipeline of organizers that are equipped um, to not only know the fundamentals of organizing, but also to be innovative and creative as well. So um, with that, we also believe that those who are historically marginalized should lead the fight for social justice, which is one of our um, core values of our work. Cool, so you wanna get started with the, our, um, at C2 as a development team, we have some fundraising pillars that we would like to share with all of you who's joined us today. Um, and um, we really allow these pillars to guide our work um, and help us break down any barriers that currently exist for people who are on the front lines who are also resource mobilizers and fundraisers. And so the, our first one is we develop and follow fundraising strategies and principles that center dignity and courage. And as a development team at C2 and as individuals in everyday life, we refuse to shrink, beg, or dim our organizational light. And we will not fit into boxes when pressed and asked to do so. We accompany movement organizations and leaders in their fundraising journey. So part of this work is sharing our knowledge and know-how with others. Um, and the way we do that is we host trainings and workshops to increase fundraising skills for movement organizations and leaders. We also position ourselves as experts. And when we say that, we mean we're experts of our own experience in our lives over what our organizations do and what we know we will win. And we understand that when we're approaching philanthropy, that we have knowledge to share and it's important to center our experiences instead of catering to philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Yes, we advocate for new approaches in philanthropy. We seek to change their practices, relationships, and the dynamics that exist with movement orgs 
around philanthropy and specific, we seek to center the voices of the people on the front lines in the decision-making process and also in the application process and what is expected of us to um, request funds from philanthropic organizations. And we bring our comrades along with us. So we are creating um, and molding internal and external environments where movement folks feel comfortable and informed enough to make the ask, um, which is why part of the reason we did this is so that we could share information with you all. Yes, yes, yes. So again, these are our core principles for the way that we move in life, but also as resource mobilizers and fundraisers for the movement. Um, and just quickly, I know that we started with these pillars, but um, Michelle and Ren, would you like to tell us how you how you um, came to become a, a resource mobilizer or fundraiser for the movement? Can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to this, this moment on your journey in life? Yeah, so I can go first. Um, and what, I'm a Latina and um, I have been doing work with uh, Latin American communities and Spanish speaking communities for the past uh, seven years. Um, and so really I started doing fundraising really as a volunteer and um, didn't realize that it was actually a profession. And so when I got involved, uh, I really wanted to learn more about philanthropy, what fundraising looked like, and really uh, getting money for our movement, right? Like Kim Klein coined the term. Um, and so it's been an interesting process because I, doing, during my fundraising um, experiences, I thought fundraising was just kind of an administrative role. And the more that I've gotten to be in community with other fundraisers, it's been cool to see that we are also organizers. And that's what I always try to uh, let other development folks know. It's like, we are organizing people to raise funds. And that's really, really important for us to keep in mind when we're doing this work. Thank you. What about you? Yeah, um, I can also share my video if you wanna pause the slides for a second, just to talk. Um, but yeah, um, so I'm Ren and I was raised and radicalized in South Carolina. Um, and my experience in organizing comes from uh, working with girls, trans youth and gender non-conforming youth, specifically in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, that looked like a lot of different things, a lot of political education, um, cultural organizing and radicalization. And I found myself working specifically within fundraising and development um, with that organization because that, I, that was just a gap that I saw that needed to be filled. Um, and yeah, I've been so excited to learn about the ways that development work and fundraising work can be centered around the experiences of the people we're, we're resource mobilizing for, right? Um, I think in my experience, I see a lot of folks who have hesitations towards fundraising because um, it's it can be awkward and scary to talk about money. Um, and also nobody really wants to deal with it. But I've I found a way to really step into my power um, and tap into community power through resource mobilizing. And so, yeah, that's why I'm here and I love it. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll pass it to you, Kiera, if you also want to share. Yes, thank you. Um, again, my name is Kiera Sims. I'm also from South Carolina. <laughs> um, and I um, got my feet wet in organizing as a youth organizer. I was a youth organizer for about 11 years um, of my life. And through all of my work around youth organizing, I realized that our work um, wasn't growing as rapidly because of our lack of skills of fundraising and or the lack of skills of people's ability to say yes to our work and yes to our innovation and yes to the work that mattered, especially um, when I was in South Carolina. And so as an educator, I was really, I realized that I have uh, skills to talk to people, to write, uh, to mobilize people in new and different ways that they haven't before. Mm -hmm. And once I tapped into that skill set, um, I'm happy to say that I now work with a team of people who also help me tap into that skill set every single day. And I feel like it's an honor to be trusted as a development person or fundraiser 
or resource mobilizer in the movement um, and that we all take our roles very seriously um, and really have fun <laughs> at the same time while building that trust, not only with each other, but also with the people we, the individuals we raise money from, but also um, with the foundations that we bring alongside with us. Um, so with that, we'll get into our best practices as a development team at C2, and then we'll take some questions and answers after that. Just give me 30 seconds to get my slides pulled up. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Um, so I'm going to talk us through a couple just basic best practices um, when you're, yeah, thinking about fundraising or working on it. So the goal here is to be very informed about your work and to follow your gut. Um, I personally have experienced significant doubt, doubt when fundraising, as I know a lot of people do. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's really important to like own the knowledge that you hold. And so along with that, um, here's a few tips that we have. One is to create an, a one pager with the key information you really want everyone to know. Um, and you can stylize this one pager based on your specific audience. But um, if you think through the questions that people usually ask you when you talk about your work, that's a really good place to start. Um, then along with sharing information about your awesome group or organization, you really want to be open and honest about what your work is and why you do it and what the values are that inform your work. Um, and then another really important practice is following up with people, whether you're uh, talking to individual donors, maybe you're talking to someone who gave $10 or you're talking to someone who gave $10,000. It's still really important to always say thank you. Um, thank you for committing to the work and giving in whatever way you want. Um, and to just establish that relationship by following up on what you said you'll do with your commitments. Um, and checking in with folks throughout the year. Um, and checking in can look like giving updates. It can look like sharing out what your new programming or new events might be. Um, or it can just be saying hi to check in and um, to really just cultivate that relationship with whoever you're talking to. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we talk about infrastructure needs. So when you're talking about money, uh, you wanna make sure you have a, a concrete way of tracking money. That doesn't mean it has to be a super fancy uh, donation tracking system. It can be a spreadsheet um, if your budget is small, but just to have that information. Um, you also wanna know how you're going to ask for money or raise money. So usually that means a fundraiser plan or um, even just a basic, so for this first year, we're hoping to raise this much money and this is how we're gonna get there. A support system. Ugh, I think the number one thing that makes fundraising hard is feeling like you're in it alone. And so a support system of people, even if they aren't super skilled in fundraising, just people there to, like cheer you on to help you when the workload gets heavy um, is super important and helpful. And then lastly, I kind of talked about this a bit, but your budget, it's very important to know um, what your organization needs um, and the funding that will get you there and your general overall goal of, well, this is how much it takes for us to accomplish these things in a year because um, your donors and your foundation folks, anyone you talk to about money is, of course, going to want to look at your budget. Um, and yeah, we mentioned this before, but teamwork always makes the dream work. That's very cheesy, but I said it anyways. Um, and I just want to shout out Kiera and Michelle specifically because we work together as a team and it's made resourcing our work just feel so much lighter. Um, and exciting. So yeah, those are our best practices in general. And now I'll pass it over to Kiera to talk specifically about foundations. 
Yes, thank you, Rain. Um, at C2, we have uh, several sources of income. Two of our main sources are from foundations and individual donors. And so today um, we will go more in depth around foundations and individual donors, but there are other sources of income that your organization or group may have that could be from fundraisers, um, that can be from corporate organizations, that could be from in-kind donations because those are also a resource. Um, and also now that I say in-kind donations, I also wanna challenge everyone um, on this call, including myself to also think about how are we resourcing our movements and, how, and most often that doesn't always look like money. Um, and so resources for our movement can look like food, free space, um, volunteer time. It can look like um, showing a person that shows up over and over and over again and provide their services for you for free. And so um, this workshop and session is focused on donors and individuals and best practices as an organization as it, as it is reflected in C2. But also just know that there are a variety of resources that exist that aren't just financial, that your development team and or program people or organizers or leaders can help you um, pinpoint. So with that, best practices for foundations, our number one goal or one of our main goals is to build authentic relationships that center our community's needs. Um, and so, and not only our needs, but our community's dignity. To us, di dignity is very, very important when um, speaking to and building relationships with foundation and we, with foundations and we center our individual and collective dignity when um, inviting people to join and support our work. So with foundations, just know that you are the expert. You aren't going to people begging them to support your work. You are going to them, inviting them to support the amazing things that you're doing in your community. So situate yourself as such. Know that you know your work best and you know what your people need best and that you are going to foundations to invite them to join your team and be a resource for your team. Most importantly, um, you wanna build a, a, a relationship with program officers or um, at foundations that may look different for each foundation, but that relationship may look like just checking in quarterly or adding them to, if you do quarterly or um, monthly emails, adding them to your email list or just checking in about everyday life, just going to grab tea or coffee if you have already formed that relationship with them. Sometimes we reach out to our foundations um, program officers to get advice um, and really be real about the challenges that we're going through and the opportunities that we see and how we can build and support um, the movement together through the resources that both C2 and our foundation and program officer brings. Know that um, you can bring your community members and or your whole ass team with you. <laughs> and so as a development person who's rooted in organizing and was an educator at a regional institution for a very long time, um, I know about the work that we do and feel deeply aligned and tied to it. But I often um, bring Shinyeri, who you saw at the beginning of this call to our meetings. I bring Bree, who's um, our director of action strategy. Sometimes I bring Michelle or Ren or if it's a very specific project, I invite that project, the lead of that project to the meeting so that um, your whole organization feels like they have a relationship with the foundation and not just relying on one individual person. And then also be prepared, um, create an agenda and be creative in your agenda making, um, but be prepared with an agenda and um, to ask and answer any questions that they may have of you. Just a few more steps, know your budget, um, know how much money you need, um, how much money you have left to fundraise and know what your goal is for at least the project you're asking money for. Um, know what resources are needed. So again, those resources can go beyond financial. Sometimes program officers can offer communication support. Sometimes they can offer, um, um, program officers can offer databases, say for instance, if you um, now have enough people on your email list that you wanna keep track of them in a very unique way, they may be able to offer you services through their database of a sort. Program officers will ask you, what do you need for, uh, from us? And this is my plea for everyone on this call listening and watching today to always think beyond financial need 
when asked, what do you need from us? Be clear about your organization's short and long-term goals and outcomes. And that clarity can be three to four bullet points. It can be one bullet point, but just be clear about what you're doing. Um, if I am hosting a fundraiser um, on Saturday uh, to end Money Bill in New York City, I need to know why ending Money Bill is important. I need to know how much money we need to um, meet our campaign goals. And I need to know what our demands are within that campaign when I'm sitting down to talk to anyone, not just foundation or program officers, to anyone in my life about that campaign. So just become um, prepared for that information. And then don't be afraid to make the ask. Um, and don't expect an immediate yes, but end any meeting with the amount, um, with what you need. And so an example of that would, may look or feel like, hey, I'm excited that we had this conversation today. Just so we are aware, here are some next steps of A, B, and C that I, Kiara, plan to follow up on. But I also want to be clear about the support that I can receive from XYZ Foundation. Can you let me know, are you able to support our work in this way today? Or if we should follow up with further conversations with you or someone on your team or at your organization that may be willing to have further conversations with us. That was off the top of my head, but <laughs> that is an example. And I'm gonna pause there to give time for the ASL to catch up. Okay. Um, and just so you know, we will be tracking Q&A in the chat. So if you have any questions for us, we do have time at the end of this workshop to answer your questions directly. I'm gonna move forward to um, Michelle. It's gonna walk us through some donor best practices. Thanks, Kira. I appreciate it. So um, donors, right? The big scary part because we have to talk to people. We have to interact with people. And that's always a scary part, right? Especially when it comes to asking for money. So really the goal with donors is not just to recruit them, but retain them and also upgrade them. Because it's not just about bringing new donors into the organization, but we want to keep them part of our organizations because they can also be uh, our representatives in the community as well and advocate for us, right? And by moving them up the donor ladder, we are getting them to invest more of their resources into the organization as the partners that we're asking them to be, right? Um, the number one pe reason people make a donation is because someone asked them. So you should definitely practice, practice, practice asking because Failure is not asking. So make sure that you are comfortable asking, but not only that, that your belief in your cause is greater than your fear. And the number one reason why people keep giving, right, that they're retained is because someone thanked them. So a best practice is usually to send them a little thank you within 48 hours of their donation, but no matter how late your um, appreciation may be, they will always remember it um, and they'll appreciate it. I've had lots of donors who like received a little postcard from me, even if it was late, they sometimes will email about it. Or if I see them in, in the future, they'll be like, oh, I got your postcard. Thank you so much. So those little things like that are very, very important in order to retain donors. And again, success is asking. Don't be afraid. And if you need to practice. Um, and the biggest thing and why I mentioned organizing earlier is because we focus on building relationships with these folks, right? It's not just about getting as many people to donate as possible. It's about building relationships that will last. And that way, these, these folks are also become representatives and advocates for the work that we're doing. Because if we, as representatives of our organization, are that bridge with them, they can also bring in more people into the fold, which is what we want, right? And then of course, to be successful in your asking, you have to make a clear case for support. Why does the organization exist? Why is that work important? And what are your core beliefs and values, right? So people love to hear about those things because they will connect with the things that are important to them. And so it's always good to share those things with them. And you should always be clear about what you need. Sometimes, most of the time, right, when we're asking, it is for money, but also what other resources do they have 
available to them, right? To Kiera's point that she was mentioning, right? It could be time, it could be a physical space, it could be meals for participants, right? So those are always things that you wanna be clear about when you're talking to a donor because they can give more than just money as well. Thank you, Michelle and Ren um, and everyone who's joined us thus far on this call. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and come on camera and we have some space available today just for some questions and answers because we would love to hear from you as well. All right. Hey, Kiara. So one of the questions that I'm seeing here is what it, What do you do to like calm your nerves? Like this use is your first time ever asking for money. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you do it? Yes, I would love for all of us to answer this question. <laughs> um, for me, I for me, that's where dignity comes in. Um, one, I see the person across the table from me as a full as human being. So we're all human. You don't have power over me, my organization, or my life, because at the end of the day, we're both humans. <laughs> and so I enter a space just reminding myself, like we are humans, we are humans, we're both humans. Even if you do work at an organization or a foundation where theoretically you may think you have power over my life and the decisions that are made in my organization, you actually don't. We are humans, we are humans, we are humans. Um, and then I really um, do a lot of work um, in the mornings. I, I take really slow mornings when I have calls with people who are um, especially foundation calls where I will drink some tea, I'll take deep breaths um, and really like lean into like the practice of trusting my gut um, throughout the day and throughout my entire life so that when, if I trust myself to enter a space with the information that I need, then making the ask just seems natural because I'm making the ask for a human to join my work. Thank you for that. That is super, super helpful. I know my first ask, I was also very, very, very nervous. So <laughs> these kinds of tips would have been really, really helpful for me. And then the last question that I'm seeing is, if you're writing a grant for the first time, how do you know, so like you can answer their questions or are there any best practices and like just the language to use or not to use? Um, I'm gonna go very, very briefly, but Ren and Michelle, please go after me. Um, I will say that we do not change our language for the people who we ask money for. Again, this work is about dignity <laughs> and centering the needs of our community. And so if our work doesn't fit your box, then we go find a new box to fit in. But I will let Ren and Michelle further elaborate. Yeah, I'll share a little bit about that. So I think one of the biggest fears, right, is that we have to shrink ourselves in order to get that money. And that's something that we don't do at all. We are very, very clear about what our goals are, what our beliefs and values are. And you know, if we have built that relationship with that funder, then the whole reason they've asked us to apply is because those values align, right? And so we shouldn't be talking about our work any differently um, than we would with like a donor or with our constituency, for example. So definitely that relationship has to be built first. And I think if you've done that work to establish that relationship, um, to be able to apply, then they should already know, right, where you are. And so I think, don't be nervous about being very explicit about who you are and why you do what you do. Yeah, thanks for sharing those, y'all. Those are great. I would also add that one thing I struggled with when I was first grant writing is I found that my organization was actually a little uh, more radicalized or ahead of the foundation because foundations are just following organizing's lead. And so if you find that that's happening in your work, you can use that as an education opportunity as well to say, oh, I see that you're interested. Um, so for example, maybe they're interested in prison reform, but you are a prison abolitionist organization. You can use that opportunity to talk to them about what prison abolition actually means and how liberation can be achieved in that way and move them a little bit forward like in that path as well. 
Thank you so much for answering the questions. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. It's been great. And thank you everyone who joined us for this session. We'll see you in 10 minutes for our next section around direct action. Hello and welcome back to the Blackout Collective's um, track session here at Keep It 100 from the front line. Uh, my name is Chinyeti Tutashinda and I am the one of the founders and former co-director at the Blackout Collective and now the director of the Center for Third World Organizing of which Blackout is one of our hub and sister organizations. So I'm really excited today to be able to introduce you to Brianna Gibson, our Director of Action Strategies, who's going to lead you through a DA 101 and some quick tips on how to make sure you're ready to go out in the streets. So Brianna. Great. Thanks, Janieri. Um, Hey, everyone. Happy to be here with you today. I hope folks are doing well. Um, like Chinieri said, my name is Brianna Gibson. I'm the Director of Action Strategies and Programs, um, and I use they or she pronouns. And we're going to do like a super quick, super basic uh, direct action training today, uh, the 101 of the 101s, um, because it's a short amount of time. But at the end, I'll also let folks know how they can get in contact if they want more information, um, because trainings is one of the things that the Blackout Collective offers, training specifically in direct action. Um, so let's just dive straight into it. So yeah, you're like, okay, you just told me this is a training about direct action. I don't even know what that is. That's cool. I got you because we're about to talk about it, right? So when we're thinking about direct actions, you've probably seen some, even if you don't know that that's what you were looking at, you didn't have the technical term for it, right? So when we have, when you see people doing banner drops or mass call-ins, people doing different kinds of meeting disruptions, people doing sit-ins sometimes at their mayor's office or at a governor's mansion, um, any sort of blockades or noise demonstrations and even like your mass marches and rallies, right? Which I'm sure folks got to see a lot of that over the past year. Um, and a lot of it generally tends to happen in general. It's a favorite tactic of a lot of people. Um, but those are all examples of direct action. Um, and there are many more examples. We won't get to talk about all of them here. But yeah, you're definitely welcome to look up the different tactics that exist. There are a lot of ways 
to take action or participate in direct action. Um, and these are just some examples of how people do it on a regular basis. Um, so we're gonna move on into now talking about, all right, now you have some examples of what this thing is and maybe you think, okay, well, I might have an idea myself of what it is, um, but I also know that I've actually seen this thing before. It's not completely foreign, but let's talk about how do we define direct action? Um, so the Blackout Collective has a definition of direct action that we use and share with folks um, that we find super useful. I'm happy to see if folks like can drop in the chat also if things resonate with them, but I'm gonna share out our action definition um, that we use and we teach with folks. So direct action is a tactic used to make an immediate intervention that stops business as usual. Um, the purpose of it is to cause a crisis of conscience for the public and a crisis for the state, the elite and or corporations. So it's transformational in nature for those using the tactic and it aims to transform the practitioner, the material conditions, the target and the relationship of, the, of oppressed people to power. So you'll notice that there are a few different words or phrases here that are highlighted in a different color. And those are just things that typically I like to check in with folks um, because they are key aspects of the definition um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page about it, right? So the first one is that direct action is a tactic, meaning that it's one, one tool that we have in our large toolbox when we talk about what does it mean for us to organize and move and mobilize towards liberation? So this is just one of the things that we can do. And we know that we have a lot of other tactics that we use in what we call our strategy, right? Which is our roadway, our pathway, how we believe that we're gonna get there. Um, the second thing that you'll see highlighted here is that it's used to make an immediate intervention that stops business as usual. So yeah, when people talk about protests being disruptive, sometimes it's named as a complaint and we tell people that's, that's the ex entire point of it. <laughs> the point of it is for it to be disruptive. Um, and that is what's gonna grab people's attention. That is what's gonna cause the crisis um, that is talked about in the next sentence. If it weren't disruptive, people would do what they already tend to do, which is ignore it um, and keep walking, keep doing whatever it was that they were doing. Um, and then the last thing that's highlighted here is that it's transformational in nature. So it has the power to transform um, the people who are taking part in the action. And then our part of why we take action, right, is also to transform all of these other things and people, including the material conditions themselves. So what are the conditions that we live in that we want to shift? Um, and at the baseline, that's part of why we take action in order to ultimately shift those conditions. Um, so, because this is a crash course, kind of, um, we're going to get into some tips for what if you want to plan a direct action? You're like, yeah, I have something I really care about, and I want to make some noise about it. I want to um, cause folks to really think deeply about what side they're on on this issue. I want to force the issue uh, and hopefully shift some material conditions. What would you do? I don't know. Um, Luckily for you, it's a crash course with some handy dandy tips. So the first thing that we ask folks to do um, is to find a crew of people you trust. Um, so your action can be small, it can be really large, but either way you need to find a group of people that you trust in order to plan with. Um, and then after you do that, you're gonna go ahead and identify your target, your location and your messaging. So all of those things are gonna be based on, of course, what you're doing, what is the what it is that you are trying to accomplish, how are you using this tactic and your broader strategy will typically determine what these things are. Who is your target? Uh, who or what is your target? What's the location um, and what your messaging is going to be? And then you'll see in here it says including scouting. Um, scouting is just a way of saying that I have looked at this location before and I know that what we are thinking of maybe doing um, is possible and or I have looked at this location, I maybe haven't thought about what's possible, but now I have some good ideas. That's how scouting means. Um, and then you make a plan with your homies, the people that you really trust. Um, you talk through what it is that you intend to do, how you're gonna do it, when you're gonna do it, and what materials you might need. 
So after you do that, and this, some of this is like iterative, right? So you might do some of this and then do the next thing. And then you might come back to what you were just doing because maybe something changed. So keep that in mind as I'm talking through these things, but you're also gonna assess your risk and resources. So what do you have in order to pull off the things that you all wanna do that you maybe have been planning to do? Um, and then also what's the risk of doing these things and figure out are folks prepared to take that level of risk? It may be that people aren't prepared to take that level of risk and you need to think of a different plan. It may be that some people are and some people aren't. And so maybe there's a plan that has different layers to it, right? But it's a conversation you wanna have so that everyone can make sure that they're consenting to the level of risk that's there um, and that they know what steps to take in order to best protect themselves or best show up in the scenario. Um, once you have your plan down, you're going to need to make sure you fill roles and pull in allies. So roles are just people who help to make your, sure your action goes as well as possible. So if we're thinking of, you know, your typical mass march or rally, your roles might be uh, that you are going to have some folks whose job it is to give out snacks to people. People tend to get hungry um, and make sure that people have water because even though the CDC said people don't have to wear masks, you know, that's only if you're vaccinated technically. So you might have some folks who are there to do some level of mutual aid and give people supplies such as personal protective equipment. Um, you may have people who are marshals who help to guide people along the route of your march. Those are all examples of roles that are important in making something like a march and rally happen. Um, and then pull in any allies. So that's folks who are aligned with what you all are trying to do um, and are willing to lend some level of support to you. So it might be that your allies help to take on some roles. It might be that your allies help to um, provide you with some resources. Maybe you need 10 mega uh, phones and you only have three. And so you pull in some allies to get you some of the materials that you need. And sometimes your allies also just amplify so that as many people as you want to be there can be at your action. Um, and then you're going to practice and execute. So with some smaller actions, sometimes there are things that physically we need to practice um, together. And then with things that, again, going back to the example of a march or a rally, sometimes it is that people in particular roles need to practice to make sure that they're prepared as much as possible to deal with whatever may happen when we're taking action. And we know that, like we said before, this is inherently disruptive. So you might have some annoyed people, you might have some unexpected events, someone maybe just maybe won't start feeling well in the middle of things and you'll have one of your medics need to practice. What does it mean to tend to someone who's not feeling well in the middle of the things? Um, but yes, yeah, these are basic tips for planning a direct action. So there are actions that we plan, and then there are actions that sometimes we don't plan at all. And we we just heard about an action, we saw some a flyer online, or one of our close comrades told us about it. Um, or sometimes you're just in the street and you see people doing something, and they it is uh, something that's happening in mass or with a lot of people, and it looks like you can join in, and you decide you want to join in. Um, these are some quick tips for that. So. Similar to planning, when we say get a crew of people you trust, typically advise that people go to a direct action with a buddy or a crew and make a plan. And so it doesn't have to be a detailed plan, like you're planning a direct action. Your plan might be, hey, do you want to come with me to this action that's happening tomorrow afternoon? I'm thinking of staying about an hour and a half. Does that work for you? So maybe how long you're going to be there. Um, where you'll meet in case you all get separated. So maybe it's that if anything happens, we'll meet back at the car or if anything happens, we'll meet at this intersection so that we can regroup and make sure that everyone gets home safely. Uh, you wanna tell someone who you trust where you'll be um, and you don't always necessarily know all of where you'll end up, but just letting someone know that, hey, I'm going to this thing in case anything happens, we know that the police are unpredictable. So many things are unpredictable. Um, and so in the event that something unexpected were to happen, such as you were arrested or you were injured or anything else, there's someone who knew that or knows that you're there and knows to look for you in case they don't see you or hear from you. Um, do a quick risk assessment. And so risk is one of those things that's super dependent on 
literally time, place, conditions, all the things, right? But you're gonna take do a risk assessment to the best of your ability. So that might lo mean looking at who are the folks in the crowd? What exactly are people doing? Um, who else is around? What exactly is being interrupted? Um, there is a different risk of being at a rally in a plaza versus a march that has taken over a freeway, right? Um, that most folks can understand. Uh, and it's, you're doing a similar, just quick risk assessment uh, so that you can determine whether or not that's actually something that you wanna join in doing. Um, and if so, what, what else you might wanna do in order to make sure that you feel comfortable being there. Uh, keep an eye on your people. So if you came with a buddy or a crew, make sure that you keep an eye on them. So you also know where they are. Trust your gut. Um, our guts have a lot of internal or inherent information for us. So if something doesn't feel right, it's typically not right. And feel free to just listen to your gut around what, where you should be, how you should be, um, and when and where to go. And then have an exit plan. So I kind of spoke a little bit to this earlier when I talked about making a plan with your buddy or a crew. But again, maybe have an idea of about how long you might want to be out at this action that you haven't planned. Um, and then have a plan of where you may wanna meet someone, um, where you're going afterwards, any of those things are helpful just for joining an action that you haven't planned. So you're not entirely sure what's gonna go down. Um, some quick safety tips, which are also typically helpful. So uh, you can create some action agreements with your crew before you go. Uh, so maybe that is, we are going to stay for the rally, the march, um, and you know we parked over here and we went to the gym yesterday and our legs really hurt. So maybe we won't walk on the freeway today because we might not be able to get back to our car. So maybe we're agreeing that if things get too far away from where we parked, we're just gonna call it. Um, avoid bringing unnecessary tech. It sucks to lose your phone, break your phone. It sucks to lose a laptop or a camera if you don't need it, um, obviously, we tend to have some folks whose jobs and whose uh, roles in that instance are to do a lot of documentation, which is really important for uh, the, the historical legacy of our movements, for us to be able to reflect on the things that we do, what works, what doesn't. Um, all of that's important and for other people to see for amplification, right? But if that's not your role, maybe leave your expensive camera at home or you're probably not going to write a paper or send those emails that you thought you were going to send in that couple of hours. And so you might want to leave your laptop at home, probably not necessary, right? So just avoid bringing any unnecessary tech. And then you're going to memorize the numbers of one to two people that you trust in case something happens. Um, so it could be that you get separated from your group. Sometimes phones die, uh, sometimes, you know, people are unexpectedly arrested or anything else may happen. Uh, you may lose your phone. So it's generally a good idea to memorize the number of like one or two people you trust so that in the event of an emergency where you don't have, you're not with your crew, you don't have anyone that um, around that you can talk to or get in contact with that you can at least hopefully find a phone and reach someone. Um, bring your COVID-19 safety gear, still a pandemic, um, and then any other supplies you might need. So sometimes people may proactively bring a first aid kit and uh, or like something like a portable charger if they're a live streamer, right? Um, water is important. People forget water a lot, but it's important to stay hydrated. Uh, any gloves you might need, masks, your identification, etc. cetera. Um, tend to advise that people keep things light. Um, but make sure that you have what you need um, so that you'll be prepared. So then just a quick word on technology and security as well for folks. Um, so yeah, especially in moments of like heightened tension and heightened surveillance, which we know that folks are already under a lot of surveillance, it's helpful and important for folks to kind of just minimize the amount of free information that just anyone can get about you. So we know that we believe in a world where everyone has access to self-determination, where people are liberated. Um, and we also know that everyone doesn't believe in that vision. Everyone doesn't want that vision. And some of those people actually actively wish to do us harm. Um, and so we don't want those folks to have unnecessary access to our information. So maybe 
you know, make your friends or connections private on Facebook, especially if you are typically planning some of these actions. Um, just be careful about how visible you are and how much information people may have access to who you may not want to have that access. Um, if you're organizing things, don't give people your personal cell phone number, especially people you don't know and trust. Um, you know, there's like Google phone, other virtual platforms that give you a phone number that you can use and that'll ring through to your own phone. Um, you can use different um, encrypted email uh, servers for organizing purposes uh, to minimize just like the amount of information that gets shared that is without your knowledge. And then you don't have to use your real name or personal email address to sign online petitions. Um, if you do bring your phone to an action, you want to make sure it's fully charged um, or that you have a battery pack. You want to use Signal Messenger in order to talk to other folks who might be involved, which is an encrypted platform so other people can't see your messages. Um, and if you are doing something that you think might result in you or has a high likelihood of you being arrested doing it, maybe just leave your phone at home altogether. Um, you're being tracked in term, most likely in terms of um, the like location services on your phone. And then also if you get arrested or apprehended, you don't want to give the state or the police access to your phone to go through your messages and maybe incriminate other people. Um, if you can't leave your phone at home, just turn off your location services. And also just feel free to turn off your phone if you need to bring it. Um, no face ID, no touch ID. Those things are easy to put to someone's face or put your thumb there. Um, and then if you see folks doing things that might um, cause law enforcement or someone to look for them, just maybe don't take photos of it and definitely don't upload those to social media. Um, so just some quick tips. Like I said, here's some information. If you're like, man, I really wanna learn more about this. Um, Blackout Collective offers trainings, we offer direct action support, we offer some, uh, in terms of both, like if you're planning an action and you want to support brainstorming, we support folks in person and we also do actions. So here is our information if you want to keep in touch. And I hope that this crash course offered folks a little something today. Thanks, y'all. Thanks so much for that, Brie. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, that came up through our chat. So the first one is, what roles should white folks have in direct actions for Black people? Yeah, so I would say to check in with the people who are organizing the actions, right? And they can tell you what roles they feel comfortable having you in. Um, it's not going to be a one size fits all for everyone. It's really dependent on who your community is and what it is that they want. So if you think that you have some skills to offer or a role that you can fill, just go ahead and actually check in with the folks who are organizing the actions um, and ask them where you can plug in and they'll let you know. Thank you for that. And then um, there's a few more questions here. So if someone is really nervous and they've never been to an action before, what is something that they should either do or like what would one piece of advice that you'd wanna give them? Yeah, so I mean, one, it's part of the reason why I encourage folks to go with at least one buddy, one friend, uh, because then you can <laughs> share in your nervousness with that person, right? And be able to just talk to them and lean on them. And then otherwise, someone's at my door, obviously. Um, I would also encourage folks to ground yourself in why you're there. Sometimes it's easy for us to get really in our heads, but get grounded in your body and why are you even present at this action? It's really important to you, obviously. And it's helpful to be grounded in that purpose and that you're there for something that's larger than you. And then also don't be a stranger to folks around you. Again, trust your gut, of course, in terms of who and how you're interacting with people. You don't have to exchange phone numbers. You don't have to become best friends, but it's always helpful to get to know other people and to begin building community with other people as well while you're at an action and it'll likely contribute to you feeling more at ease as well. Okay, and then the last question here is, can you talk about an action that you participated in? Maybe something that was like you were really nervous around or something that you think that people could do? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I think I was very nervous around my first action with the Blackout Collective, actually. Um, and we shut down the Bay Area rapid transit system. Um, so it was kind of a, a big deal. Um, I didn't know everyone there super well, even though we built trust through some of the steps that I talked people through in terms of planning and action. Um, and so it helped me to be able to build those relationships through the planning steps. Um, and then the day of, it also helped to just have some intentional time together to do what I just talked about, which was remind each other why we were there, to play some grounding music, to spend some time in a circle where we really just connected with um, the why of everything and how much bigger than us this was and like how we were actually there for the liberation of our people. That's what helped me to feel more at ease and much less nervous in that moment. Thank you so much, Bree. So I see we have a few more minutes. And actually, this is my question. <laughs> so, so sorry. It's one that we get a lot during trainings. I'd love if you could just go into it a little bit for people. Um, so we see a lot of marches and we see sometimes blockades or when people are blocking something. Can you give us an example or show us how do we come up with something different or creative? What are ways to do that? Yeah, so I think actually this past year has been <laughs> really instructive on creative actions because a lot of the things that people have been and are used to doing um, have not are typically not socially distanced right even if you're a lockbox it's typically not six feet away the next person to you um, so I think that sometimes conditions force you to be a little more creative in that way and then other things you know some of our trainings we get do some creative action segments and what we tell people is to all right, remove the limitations from your mind. If there was anything you wanted to do uh, in service of your campaign, in service of your organizing work, in order to propel your issue further, in order to shift material conditions, in order to get the goods, as people say, what, did it, what is it that you would do? And you can start from that point of your wildest imaginations, right? And all of that may not be possible in the moment, but I encourage folks not to recap their brain afterward, but to allow themselves to still remain in that creative space and think about, okay, maybe I don't have the ability to fly and we might not have these other things, but there are aspects of this that are important that we can actually pull off um, and that would be really dope to see and different in a way that will probably catch folks' attention um, and definitely be in service of the work that we're trying to do. Thank you so much for that, Brianna. Um, deeply helpful uh, and hopefully helpful to not just me, but to the people who are out here watching today and who will watch the videos um, afterwards. So I know we have a few more minutes, but there are some really other great sessions and another DJ set that I believe is coming up. So we're going to close a little early. Please take your bio breaks and then join us back in the main session. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>